How do we implement the knowledge of consciousness and its philosophical implications onto the everyday world? The words I'm about to speak are intended as ideas, for ideas are all we have in the ocean of potentiality. For a people liberated from tradition and irrational chains, the only barriers are the very limits of the imagination. One may begin with holding an ideal in his mind. This can take the shape of a platonic perfection, an aesthetic representation of something the imaginer holds dear. And this fetishization may launch a war in a thousand ships, as in the case of Helen of Troy. The ideal, more powerfully and um, more spiritually, may be a concept such as freedom or total dominance. And men have played these games out throughout history, locked in their dialectics since time immemorial. But what does it mean to hold an ideal in the mind? Cementing an ideal into an obsession is altogether not that different from the classic goal setting in any individual's mind. Except in this case, the goal is the total endpoint, the singularity, the transcendental object that the sentience is pulled towards. Seeing as we will all die in our attempts to live, do not let the fear of death or of failure stop you from chasing your particular individualized ideal. These words are a short tribute to Albert Camus, the French writer, philosopher, and absurdist. Camus understood the alpha and the omega, the on and the off, the reverb between trough and peak, that binary dualistic mathematical paradox of at once nothing and infinite, and he called his work absurdism. From the myth of Sisyphus to the rebel, Camus expressed the fundamental problem of sentience, absurdity. We raise our children best we can, and they are then shot in the head at school. We give out love and compassion for our closest friends, and they feed off it like ungrateful parasites. After all, no good deed goes unpunished. There is absurdity in statism, the protector entity that exists to protect the citizen, but ends up enslaving him in both a mental prison as well as a physical dystopia of involuntary forced actions and attacks on simply being alive. There is absurdity in every nook and cranny you dare to look in. You will be faced by an absurd reflection. So what is one to do? Camus wrote that the acknowledgement of absurdity opens the door to true action. When faced with the absurd, you are essentially faced with a choice. Towards infinity, or towards oblivion. He wrote his book, The Rebel, for which he was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature, in the post-World War II period in Europe. Um, while, when the elderly were busy burying the fit bodies of their dead children, the pieces of their dead children, machine guns, shrapneled and gassed on the orders of bitter old men sat in bunkers or war rooms. The absurdity is very clear of angry men sending uniformed rows of young, fit men and women to march obediently towards their deaths in the killing fields and the trenches. Ultimately, the only abstract ideals to hold in the mind in a world dominated by absurdity are love and freedom. To pursue both, to spread both, to hold both as the highest ideals for any indigent sentience in this universe, to me, sounds dangerously sane. It sounds dangerously subversive. And now, amidst a plethora of post-apocalyptic films and books and prelapsarian blogs dragging us towards the mathematically inevitable collapse of the Western financial system. As we stand in the rubble of the welfare state, we can at least live by ideals in a world fraught with disinformation. The rebel or a rebel may be stopped at any given time, but he's being born all over the world, angry and hungry for change, a drop in an ocean of human beings who will be predators upon the predators, uprooting flags, smashing control grids, opening hearts and minds with the only two things that make sense anymore in our absurd world, freedom and love. I want to now turn to the words of Camus himself. 
and I want to share these words that have invigorated my human spirit over the years. This is just a short collection of quotes from the works of Albert Camus. A living man can be enslaved and reduced to the historic condition of an object. But if he dies in refusing to be enslaves, enslaved, he reaffirms the existence of another kind of human nature which refuses to be classified as an object. If I try to seize this self of which I feel sure, if I try to define and to summarize it, it is nothing but water slipping through my fingers. I don't know whether this world has a meaning that transcends it, but I know that I cannot know that meaning and that it is impossible for me to just know, know it now. What can a meaning outside my condition mean to me? I can only understand in human terms. What I touch, what resists me, that I understand. And these two certainties, my appetite for the absolute and for unity, and the impossibility of reducing this world to a rational and reasonable principle, I also know that I cannot reconcile them. What other truth can I admit without lying, without bringing in a hope I lack, and which means nothing within the limits of my conditions? The absurd is an experience to be lived through, a point of departure, the equivalent in existence of Descartes' methodical doubt. Absurdism, like methodical doubt, has wiped the slate clean. It leaves us in a blind alley but, like methodical doubt, it can, by returning upon itself, open up a new field of investigation, and in the process of reasoning then pursues the same course. I proclaim that I believe in nothing, and that everything is absurd, but I cannot doubt the validity of my proclamation, and I must at least believe in my protest. The first and only evidence that is supplied me within the terms of the absurdist experience is rebellion. Rebellion is born of the spectacle of irrationality confronted with an unjust and incomprehensible condition. One might think that a period which, in a space of 50 years, uproots, enslaves, or kills 70 million human beings should be contemned out of hand but its culpability must still be understood. In more ingenious times, when the tyrant raised cities for his own greater glory, when the slave chained to the conqueror's chariot was dragged through the rejoicing streets, when enemies were thrown to the wild beasts in front of assembled crowds, the mind did not reel before such unabashed crimes, and the judgment remained unclouded. But slave camps under the flag of freedom, massacres justified by philanthropy or by a taste for the superhuman, in one sense, cripple judgment. On the day when crime dons the apparel of innocence, through a curious transposition peculiar to our times, it is innocence that is called upon itself to self-justify. For those of us who have been thrown into hell, mysterious melodies and the torturing images of a Spanish beauty will always bring us, in the midst of crime and folly, the echo of that harmonious insurrection which bears witness throughout the centuries to the greatness of humanity. And finally, the welfare of the people in particular has always been the alibi of tyrants and it provides the further advantage of giving the servants of tyranny a good conscience. It would be easy, however, to destroy that good conscience by shouting to them, if you want the happiness of the people, let them speak out and tell what kind of happiness they want and what kind they don't want. But in truth, the very ones who make use of such alibis know they are lies. They leave to their intellectuals on duty the chore of believing in them and of proving that religion, patriotism and justice need for their survival the sacrifice of freedom. <laughs>